Diabetes mellitus. Glucose regulation is the process of maintaining optimal blood glucose levels. Diabetes mellitus, or DM, once known as sugar diabetes, is a very common chronic endocrine disorder of impaired glucose regulation that affects the function of all cells and tissues. Complications of diabetes mellitus, especially hypertension and hyperlipidemia, which is high blood lipid levels, levels <laughs> are responsible for many associated... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness, I choked on my own saliva there. <laughs> All right. Um, they are responsible for many associated life-shortening health problems in the U.S., Canada, and other affluent con countries. You may notice that this book refers a lot to Canada. And somebody told me that Canada was thinking about, you know how we have reciprocal states, that maybe we might have a reciprocal country. I don't know. We'll see. <clears throat> many adults have undiagnosed diabetes, and among those who are diagnosed, many continue to have high blood glucose levels. <coughs> Excuse me, my goodness. <clears throat> the complications of diabetes mellitus can be greatly reduced with glycemic control or blood glucose control, along with management of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Nursing priorities focus on helping the patient with diabetes achieve and maintain permanent lifestyle changes and keep blood glucose levels and cholesterol levels as close to normal as possible to slow or prevent long-term complications. And that's the name of the game. It's keeping that blood sugar under control. You'll notice that doctors will uh, keep a tighter, try to keep a tighter control on younger people who have diabetes, which makes sense because you've got many more years to go with hyperglycemia causing problems than somebody, say, 80. But we'll get to that. So <clears throat> let me see. How, so I, how do I want to start this? Let's go this way. What I hope to do when you're in class is to play these three videos here. I really like them. They're from a, a place, a, a website called DLife. They have shows, and they're just so helpful for people that have diabetes. The host is a man who's had type 1 diabetes almost from the beginning of his life. So anyway, I hope to show these when, uh, when we meet. So type 2 diabetes was discovered by physician Solomon Burson and Rosalind Yallow who used radio immunoassay technology. They developed a method for measuring insulin in the blood, and they noticed that some people with diabetes still made their own insulin. They identified insulin-dependent type 1 and non-insulin-dependent type 2. Now, these videos talk about type 1 when it was, you know, um, first discovered. I don't think they put a year with those two people because these are the guys who discovered insulin. So, glucose control. Okay. <clears throat> glucose arrives in the bloodstream from one of three sources. Either the carbohydrates you've eaten, or if you have not had a chance to eat and your blood sugar's gotten low, glucose is released from stored glycogen in muscles and liver cells. So, the body does take in all that excess glucose and, and stores as much as it can to be used later. Or three, glucose that's newly created in the liver or the kidney cells. So say I'd used up all of my resources, my liver could then create some gluconeogenesis or glucose for me by gluconeogenesis. <clears throat> glucose in the bloodstream is transported to target cells. Every cell in the body needs glucose for energy. The brain especially needs glucose for energy. And then insulin is received, released from the pancreatic beta cells. So the two hormones primarily responsible for the homeostasis of glucose control are released by the pancreas. That is insulin, which is released from the beta, beta cells of the pancreas, and then glucagon, which is released from the alpha cells of the pancreas. And the two of those work together to keep your blood glucose level stable. Okay, <clears throat> insulin facilitates transport of glucose across the membrane to the cell's interior. We call it a key. It's the key that unlocks the door. Glucose will be floating around in your bloodstream 
uh, and insulin takes that glucose and puts it into the cell, helps it unlocks the cell and helps it get into the cell. Inside the cell, glucose is metabolized as fuel, releasing energy. If blood glucose levels are high, more insulin is secreted by the pancreas to drive that glucose into those cells. When blood glucose is driven into the cells and metabolized, glucose levels in the blood fall. Then here's a little video of type 1 and type 2 diabetes so you can see what they're talking about. Um, <clears throat> when there's a disruption in the production of insulin, that's insulin deficiency, or when there are defects in the effective action of insulin at the cell membrane, which is insulin resistance, those receptors are not recognizing the insulin. And so it kind of starts like this. Now in type 1, they make no insulin at all. There is no insulin to move that glucose into the cell, and they'll eventually die. In type 2, they may make enough insulin, but it's just not used properly by the body. The receptor cells don't recognize it, and it may take more and more and more insulin to finally affect that receptor cell and let that glucose in. So really, people who have type 2 diabetes are hypo, hyperinsulinic. Is that what they call it? Their insulin levels, that's really what they should measure to begin with. Their insulin levels are hyperinflated because the body, think of it like the thyroid that we just talked about. It's because the body is trying so hard to get that glucose into the cells that it makes more and more and more insulin to get it in. Which is, there's an interesting theory out there that perhaps type 2 diabetics should never have outside insulin. You know, a lot of type 2 diabetics, like my mom was one, for example, they just eventually put her on insulin and nothing else. Well, maybe she didn't need extra insulin. Maybe she was already hyperinsulinized anyway, and we should have figured something else out. <clears throat> it's interesting. So, um, where are we at? Insulin resistance. Glucose cannot effectively cross the cell membrane to enter the cell. Instead, Glucose remains in the bloodstream, and the blood glucose levels rise above normal. Oh, I added something to my slides. My goodness, I was thrown here. So, okay, if the blood glucose level falls too low, then insulin released in the pancreas is suppressed. So we shut the insulin off. If the blood sugar falls too low, shut the insulin off because we don't want to drive any more into the cells. Glucose remains in the bloodstream instead of being driven into the cells in response to a low blood glucose level. So I don't know if any of you guys have experienced that. It's not a very good feeling. But say you have a low, and you can do that. You can experience that to a little bit, even if there's nothing wrong with your pancreas. You know, you're out. Say you were out um, working in the yard, and you had gone six hours after eating. And you just weren't paying any attention. All of a sudden, you kind of get that sickly feeling. Well, it won't last forever if your pancreas is working correctly. It will yell at the liver or wherever the stores are, and they'll put forth that glucose back into your system. You'll feel normal. It's only when the pancreas doesn't work correctly that a person continues to drop. So in response to low blood glucose, le glucose levels, glucagon is released from the pancreatic alpha cells, and then that stimulates the production and release of glucose from glycogen stores in the liver. So it's like a little stimulant, the alpha, the glucagon. <clears throat> and then the liver will release it or produce it, whichever one it needs to do. <clears throat> and here he goes, a little, a little um, mnemonic that shows you homeostasis. I love these things. Makes it so clear, doesn't it? Okay, so diabetes mellitus, groups of disorders are characterized by elevated blood glucose levels. Really, the percentage is higher now. I think it's 30.1 million, maybe more people in the U.S. are affected, and that's including, um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, this must not be my most current slide here. I'm looking, sorry, guys. Let me make sure that... On 1281 is that table. 1281, table 64.1. Yep, we're good. Okay. I just must have added something extra to my own. <clears throat> so there's actually 30.3 million people in the United States affected 
which is diagnosed and undiagnosed, uh, 10% type 1, 90% type 2, There is gestational diabetes, and that affects 2 to 10% of all pregnancies. It's less com- their less common types are due to specific causes. For example, Cushing syndrome can cause, some di- can cause diabetes, hyperthyroidism, pancreatitis, drugs like corticosteroids. My grandpa was on prednisone for a long time, and he had prednisone-induced type 2 diabetes. Thiazides can do it, fentolin. Fintoin and clozapine. So, hyperglycemia is a hallmark of diabetes mellitus. If you have type, if you have gestational diabetes, it increases your risk for type two later on in life. But you do not have to get it. If you take care of yourself, you will. You can postpone that, maybe even forever. Let's see what else do I want to tell you. And then now we're going to talk about type 1 diabetes, commonly diagnosed below age 30. So remember, it used to be, it used to be that we call it juvenile diabetes, juvenile onset of diabetes. We don't call it that anymore. Um, They just now call it type 1 or type 2. And the reason for that is people can be older now and get type 1. For example, when I worked for diabetes Uh, as a diabetes nurse educator at Bedford, we had a lady that was 71 years old and her pancreas just stopped. She'd never had any problems with blood sugars in her life, she said. No low blood sugars, no family history, no nothing. But her pancreas pooped out and at 71 she was a type 1 diabetic. So that's happened frequently. And here's another example. I know somebody who is 20, it was actually a student, 20 years old, and was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now, normally you would have thought it would have been type 1, but it wasn't. It was type 2. So no longer can they make it, you know, juvenile diabetes or, or uh, adult onset diabetes. It's now type 1 and type 2 or insulin dependent and non-insulin dependent. But that can throw you as well. So the etiology is there's some thought out there that there might be a viral infection, especially for type 1 and that a virus had attacked the pancreas and knocked out those beta cells. Not so much for type 2, because type 2 does come on later in life and generally has different risk factors that could be modifiable. And then autoimmunity. Could there be something, an autoimmune disorder like lupus or, you know, something where the body attacks its own self? Um, There is pancreatic cell destruction in type 1. Is like I said before, They are completely um, without insulin. In children and young adults, this process is usually rapid with total insulin deficiency occurring within a year after which lifelong insulin injections are required. If the disease begins in adulthood, the autoimmune destruction of beta cells has a more variable but generally slower time frame. I also knew a guy who... Um, he was a friend and at 17 years old he he just got horribly skinny and was ravenous thirsty and pee and they thought what the heck's happened to him and, the, and it turned out that he had just developed type 1 diabetes just hit him just like that type 2 diabetes <clears throat> it Is a growing epidemic in the United States. I will tell you, though, that it does seem to have stabilized a bit. There for a while, it was just, in like 2015, it was just really, really kind of scary. It was so, um, prevalent. Okay, so in 2017, it says the prevalence was 9.4% of the population, up 3% from 2000. Let's see, we did say uh, type 2 is 90-95% of the cases, more common in adults than in juveniles. We talked about that. Risk factors involve genetics and lifestyle, and that's kind of the difference here. There are some things you can change 
And then prediabetes is a warning sign for type 2. It's a coming. It's a coming. So the modifier, oh, I've also got, it's now the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. Modifiable risk factors for type 2 diabetes includes body mass index greater than 26. Well, huh. That makes me want to laugh because it doesn't take much to have a body mass index greater than 26 and you're still slender. But they are going a lot by the waist circumference because uh, that met, uh, metabolic syndrome can cause layers of, or well, let me just tell you, extra insulin in your body, extra cortisol in your body can just layer fat all over your gut. Well, then you're at risk for visceral adipose tissue, I should say it like that. And visceral means it is surrounds your intestines, or not intestines, your organs. It surrounds your organs, and that becomes dangerous. You can also have a thin person who has visceral adipose tissue. It's just generally, though, it usually follows obesity. So physical inactivity. <clears throat> um, if you're HDL, remember that's your good fat when in your cholesterol panel. The HDL is... Um, Oh, shoot, I can't remember what it stands for. Oh, here it is, high-density lipid cholesterol. That is our protective fat. We want that to be high. So if it's low, then you, it puts you at a greater risk for heart problems. And then tr triglyceride levels, we want those to be uh, low, too. This says greater, oh, oh, no, no, here it is. And triglyceride levels that are greater or equal to 250 or more causes you problems and if you have an HDL that is less than 35 you're in trouble and then the metabolic syndrome which um, <clears throat> I've got that on page 1287 you know they don't talk much about the metabolic syndrome anymore that was let me see if I can find it here here it is metabolic syndrome is the simultaneous presence of metabolic factors known to increase the risk for developing type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And so features of this syndrome include abdominal obesity, waist circumference of 40 inches or more for men and 35 or more for women, hyperglycemia, fasting blood glu glucose levels of 100 or more on or on drug treatment for elevated blood glucose levels, hypertension, systolic blood pressure of 130, or more over 85 or more or on treatment for hypertension hyperlipidemia triglyceride levels of 150 or more or on drug treatment for elevated triglycerides so they're, what they're trying to say is is that you could still have the metabolic syndrome if you're on drug treatment for those things that are out of whack like your lipids and your cholesterol and your blood sugar it also says uh, HDL, this says less than 40 for men and less than 50 for women. Any of these health problems increase the rate of atherosclerosis and the risk for stroke and coronary heart disease and early death. So we teach patients about lifestyle changes that can improve their health. <clears throat> Non-modifiable, oh gosh, that scared me. Non-modifiable risk factors. These are things you cannot do anything about. First degree relative with diabetes. For example, my mom had diabetes, her mom had diabetes, and her mom had diabetes. Members of a high-risk ethnic population, African Americans, Latino, Native American, Asian American, and Pacific Islanders are all, it's almost all of us, isn't it? Who is, who's not on here? Um, are all at a higher risk for diabetes. And you, you know, you can't help but wonder, uh, for example, I'll say Asian Americans. I'm pretty sure that the Asian population um, in general, without Western diet influence, does not have this problem. Once they got the Western diet influence, then they start having the problem. Same thing for Latinos. They never had, and American Indians uh, or Native Indians, they never had these problems until they, the, until they took on the Western diet because it's trash. It's trash, and I'm living proof of it. It's easier said than done. I'll tell you something interesting, too, that I'm reading about is special seasonings, coatings, et cetera, that they put on our foods to addict us to it. What do you think about that? I think there might be some truth to that. Pretty scary. 
Women who deliver babies weighing greater than or equal to nine pounds or more, or if you were diagnosed with gestational diabetes, now remember these are non-modifiable. Hypertension, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, they usually give them um, metformin, and they will generally, people with polycystic ovarian syndrome will have gestational diabetes as well. They also have hypertension. Uh, hemoglobin A1C greater than or equal to 5%. Now remember the hemoglobin A1C is the measurement, and we'll talk about that here shortly and I'll, I'll repeat it then, but it's the blood test that we take that does not require fasting and it measures the last two to three months of, of your of the blood, the, the affinity for sugar on blood cells. So for example, when you have high blood, blood sugar, your red blood cells are coated with it, coated with it. So your A1C measures that. And the more sugar that's on your blood cells, the higher the A1C is. When you do something about it, when you exercise, when you eat better, when you take medicines and you bring that blood sugar down, every 120 days, remember, our red blood cells are, are destroyed and replenished every 120 days. So if they measure that blood test in two months and you've been doing all the things you're supposed to, we should see that A1C go down because your red blood cells should have less glucose attached to them. And then a history of cardiovascular disease. Okay. And here, look what happened to us eating all them little Debbie cakes. Look at that. A little diabetes. It was going to catch up to us one of these days. Just think when they introduced hydrogenated oils in the, I think it was the 40s, wasn't it? When they were trying to come up with ways to help us keep food for longer. So if you use this hydrogenated oils, then your food was going to be better. And then some of those oils like Crisco, it's nothing but trans fats. You know your body doesn't even know what to do with trans fats. It gets just laid on your body and then it's harder than the 80s to get rid of it okay <clears throat> we just talked about modifiable and oh this is top what what happened here i got myself all thrown off that was type two we already kind of talked about that dang it well there you go again modifiable and and non-modifiable we just talked about it. i'm gonna have to move that information over so some other things to think about is um if you're obese, if you're this, that's modifiable obesity. If you're older than 45, that's non-modifiable family history, type two diabetes. You can't modify that ethnic background. You can't modify that smoking. You can modify hypertension, abdominal obesity, increased triglycerides, low HDL, high glucose, all modifiable prediabetes, modifiable metabolic abnormalities modifiable genetics non-modifiable so there's a strong hereditary predisposition to type 2 but there are all so many modifiable risk factors prediabetes is the warning sign so once you get the prediabetes then you you know you got to do something about it so oh oh sorry guys dang it dang it dang it it's gonna do it again nope it didn't Whew. I got to turn my mail off when I do these video, uh, these, um, yeah, recorded videos, PowerPoints, pathophysiology. There's defects at the cell membrane that prevent normal action of insulin and insulin resistance develops requiring increased levels of insulin to drive glucose into the cell. Over time, the pancreas can't keep up with the increased demand for insulin. Beta cell failure appears and progresses, and toward the later stages of type 2 diabetes, insulin production declines significantly so that approximately 30% of patients with type 2 eventually require exogenous, I just learned how to say that, and I'm 60, exogenous insulin delivery to maintain normal blood glucose. They're just saying you're going to have to have insulin. However, oh, I already told you that about the hyperinsulinized people. So I think before they ever gave me insulin, I'd say, hmm, we need to figure something else out. Okay, clinical manifestations. 
signs and symptoms. Put them two together, the type one and the type two, so you can see what's similar and what is different. So when you have blood, when you have glucose in your urine and it gets over about 180 to 200, it spills. Our body can take care of about that much, 180 to 200, and then after that it's going to spill over because the kidneys can't uh, absorb it. Drugs like Invocana operate on that principle, and they keep the kidneys from reabsorbing glucose. I don't know what I think about those drugs. I'm, I'm afraid they're going to be too taxing on the kidneys. You know, it's just kind of, I don't know, I don't know. So you see, both of them have polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia, fatigue, and weight loss. Then we come over here to type 2. It also has three Ps. It's also slower onset than type 1. Type 1 is like now. Today I didn't have it. Tomorrow I do. It's the pretty quick like that. So you have the same thing as type 1 as far as three Ps and fatigue, but now you have poor wound healing. And then you have reoccurring infections, especially yeast infections and urinary tract infections. Because just think about a woman. The vagina is a moist area. And now you've got all that sugar that's come from the urine. And especially if you're an older person, male or female, you may have urine that... Um, Oh, seeps out because your sphincters aren't as tough as they used to be. And that's sugar that's come out there now to irritate those tissues. <clears throat> uh, car cardiovascular disease is extra renal insufficiency and visual problems. Because I want you to think about think about syrup and how, how syrup or honey, how does that pour off of a of a spoon? So you take that and you put that as your blood. It's it's thick. And it's going through every organ in your body, the tiny eyeballs, your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, everything that glucose is swimming through. And it's thick like syrup or even molasses, depending on how uncontrolled your, your diabetes is. <clears throat> Let's see. All the P signs are due to glucose being osmotic. Water follows glucose like water follows salt. It's a concentration thing. Loss of fluids and electrolytes. Um, oh, I wrote myself a note to say about type 1 that if they, if they stop taking their insulin, they'll drop weight dramatically. And the teenage girls at this camp I went to, I went to a camp for type 1 diabetics, that's exactly what they did. They would stop their insulin, let their glucose get outrageous so they could drop some weight. And the counselor, the doctor there, just chewed him out. I'm trying to get this coffee drink all day. Um, let's see. Type 2, this is interesting too. Type 2 can become insulin resistant as well. It doesn't happen that often, but it can happen. At that camp I was at, there was an 18-year-old gal who'd been type 1 since almost an infant and she was obese and you know generally you don't see that usually type 1s are thin and type 2s are heavy but she was very very heavy and it had just happened they had told me kind of like over the last couple of years or a year maybe that because she'd been coming to camp ever since she was a little kid so she was becoming resistant to insulin okay Long-term complications of diabetes. Now, keep in mind, this happens when you don't control your glucose. If you keep your glucose as close to normal as possible, you're not going to get these things, or at least not until you're old. So there are macrovascular complications, microvascular complications. Ma ma macrovascular cons complications involve damage to large arteries, that supply the heart and brain. The leading cause of diabetes-related death is cardiovascular disease. Increased, so they're at an increased risk for heart attack and stroke. Think about that syrup. Microvascular complications involve damage to small blood vessels, such as the eyes or the vessels to the retina. Diabetes is the leading cause of blindness. Then there's neuropathy. Neuropathy, that high high glucose irritates the myelin sheath on your nerves that causes it to sort of like peel back 
and people will have that tingly, numby feeling. I have neuropathy on my left leg. I tell you, I can't even, it's numb anymore. It's, it's, it's numb. If the neuropathy isn't coming from hyperglycemia, then I've hurt my back somehow. Because it is, it's, it's totally numb. And, but yet sometimes there's like an itch or a burn deep in my skin that I can't ever touch. Uh, gums, you can have periodontal disease. That's due to decreased circulation to the gums. Kidneys have vascular, va the vascular to the kidneys are affected by the hyperglycemia. Diabetes is the single leading cause of renal failure requiring dialysis. And then table 64 dash three, it says, is a neuropathy table. So let me turn there real quick. Yeah, it's on page 1285 and it gives you the difference, different types of neuropathies, what the complications are and what the symptoms are. So this affects, that neuropathy can affect every system in your body. You see on there complications of feet and legs People can have sores that they're not, uh, they're, they're not, um, that they don't recognize. <clears throat> Let me flip this. One. They can have sores that they don't know about. Look at that sore there on that foot. That is a typical diabetic foot sore. And when I was in my diabetes education, there were, there were a couple, several stories I've heard. Um, one was a lady that stepped on a nail that drove it up her foot. She didn't know it until she noticed her. I think it was her husband noticed the blood on the floor that they were they were redoing the floors in their house. And sure enough, that nail was up in her heel. <clears throat> Another lady had her feet up against an old Ben Franklin stove close to it and burnt her burnt the bottom of her foot and didn't realize it until it became infected. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stories out there. Some people lost their toes. Some people had some of their feet amputated. It could, it can be really bad. It can be really bad. And there you see the diabetic retinopathy where <clears throat> all of those white places are kind of like scars. Those vessels are friable because of the thick, thick viscosity of the blood due to the hyper glycemia and they burst so used to they go in there and cauterize those but they don't really do that so much now they um they try to manage it with medications my mom had the laser stuff done to her eyes and anyway and this shows you what it looks like here diabetic retinopathy and then here's some nephropathy with your kidneys and then neuropathy all these opathies Okay, now we've got some di diagnostic testing. How do we know if somebody's got blood uh, diabetes? Well, it's usually a combination of these. For example, I might take three fasting blood glucoses from three different days, and fasting needs to be at least eight hours. And then that gives you the parameters. If that person had greater than 126 each day, that's indi indicative of diabetes. Or I might do... A fasting and some random blood glucose checks if that's the case and they're non-fasting you know their random is greater than 200 and they've got signs and symptoms maybe of hyperglycemia that's also um, indic indicative of hyperglycemia postprandial just means after the meal postprandial glucose so we might check two hours after a meal um, and you, you start your count for the moment a piece of food gets in your mouth. So if I was going to eat at 3.30, my count would start at 3.30 and I'd check again at 5.30 to see what my blood sugar was. Or a glucose tolerance test, you probably heard of that, where you drink, and you may, some of you may have taken it, where you drink, mine was, I've had it before, it was an orange drink that was horribly, horribly sweet. It's hard to even choke it down. And then they measure your blood sugar at different intervals. So if you come up with greater than 200, either one of those t those tests right there, that's indicative of diabetes. If you're 140 to 199, you're in the pre-diabetes section. Then we just got through talking about the glycosylated, glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. And <clears throat> I have on here that uh, it can be drawn any time of the day. Don't forget that. No need to fast because it's not based on your fasting. The goal is to be less than 7%. Many endocrinologists want you less than 6.5 if you have, especially if you have coronary vascular disease, coronary artery disease, 
cerebrovascular disease, CVD. Microalbumin is a urine test that they also do now, and they check for protein in the urine, and it's a very good indicator of kidney damage. So that should be done early in the uh, diagnosis of, of uh, diabetes. They can check ketones in the urine, ketone urea, uh, if, and that happens when the body uses fats for energy because it can't get adequate carbohydrates, so it starts burning. It starts burning uh, fat. And after that, it'll burn protein. Your body will eat itself up in order to live. <laughs> so so your A1C, the goal is, like we said, less than 7, usually. And to correlate the A1C with the glucose level, I'll just it says it's on page 1289. An example is uh, A1C of 6 is equal to, to a, blood, a fasting blood glu- glucose of 126. And 7 is 154. Gosh, I'm so sorry for these noises, you guys. I'm, I'm, I don't know what the heck's going on. I think there's ghosts following me. There's a formula too to kind of help you to figure out what uh, estimated average glucose is, and that is you take uh, 28.7 times the A1C minus 46.7, and that'll give you an estimated average glucose. Pretty cool. I really enjoyed diabetes education. You know what, though? They were getting rid of the diabetes educator, so that stinks. It's so worthwhile. I'm telling you, it's so worthwhile. Okay. The laboratory values of a client who has diabetes mellitus include a fasting blood glucose level of 82 and a hemoglobin A1C of 5.9. What is the nurse's interpretation of these findings? The client's glucose control for the past 24 hours has been good, but overall control is poor. The client's glucose control for the past 24 hours has been poor, but the overall control is good. The value indicates that the client has poorly managed his or her disease. The value indicates that the client has managed his or her disease well. Which one would you pick? It is D. The value indicates that the client has managed his or her disease well. Her fasting, his or her fasting blood glucose is 82 and their hemoglobin is 5.1. That is perfect. Any doctor would be happy with that. Medications. There are tons of medications and I am sure that these medications aren't even up to date anymore. There's, you know, for the longest time they had no medications or just the same old medications. And then there was like an explosion of different medications around 2015. I'll just cover a few of these because there are so many of them. And there's a chart in your book as I've got listed there below. Um, you can see insulin for type 1 diabetes hardly ever is regular and MPH used anymore, but... If a person has no insurance and they have to go to a clinic, sometimes that's all that's available. It does not cover as well. And there, I mean, it's certainly better than nothing. And it's all we had for years. But it, um, you run a risk for lows. You just got to teach people to be uh, mindful of the signs and symptoms of low blood sugar so that they can take care of it. Um, Short acting is great. That's what we have now. And long acting or basal insulins, those work just like your pancreas and they keep a, a low rate of insulin going all the time, just like your pancreas does. So you, you, you know which ones those are. They have pre-mixed in, insulins for, that's generally for people who can't remember to take their insulin or they maybe hate shots and they don't want to take as many. Cause you know, if you're using insulin, you can have up to four shots a day and take my mom, for instance, in the morning or in the evening, she might have her her uh, long acting or Lantus and then also a, a coverage for in between. So anyway, pre-mixed kind of work for that. Uh, there's a slur- syringe and vial, as you already know, and insulin pens, um, sometimes insulin pumps. Some people love those. Some people don't. 
the continuous glucose monitoring system provides real-time glucose levels. There's all different kinds of those now, too. Some of them even uh, hook up to your phone so that your phone can tell you when your blood sugar is getting low. Now, that's great for people who no longer are aware. Type 1 people run a terrible risk of um, diabetes or uh, hypoglycemia unawareness. I worked with a gal like that. And she had a monitor on because she couldn't tell anymore. And then she'd just drop. Well, look how dangerous that would be in a car. Then for type 2, the first thing they try to do is diet and lifestyle changes. If they, if you can get somebody to watch their carbohydrates, I'm not talking no carbohydrates here. But to watch their carbohydrates, we usually taught, your book's got a little bit different in here, but we usually taught a minimum of 45 grams per each meal, men, men and women. And... Oh my gosh, I saw such a difference in that. So we, we, we fixed it to choices. We tried to make it as easy as possible. Now, a type 1 diabetic has to count every single carbohydrate. And they have to match how much insulin does it take, how many units of insulin does it take to take care of so many grams of carbohydrates. They have to be very precise like that. That's good and that's bad. They can eat something with a lot of carbs and take enough insulin to take care of it. See what I mean? It's very, very, you have very... Um, Precise control when you use insulin. Very precise control. Where you don't have that so much when you take oral medications. But anyway, we would teach 45 grams of carbohydrates and then teach them what a fi- one choice would be 15 grams. So, for example, I know I knew a, I would be taught a half a cup of corn is 15 grams of carbohydrates or one choice. And a glass of milk, eight ounces of milk would be one choice. It's 12 grams of carbs, but that's good enough. And it's any kind of milk. Skim. chocolate, any of them. Chocolate may have a little more carbohydrates because of sugar. But you know what I'm trying to say. Anyway, then you could teach an easy diet. Have three choices of carbohydrates at each meal. And then if you're still hungry, eat something that isn't like more meat. Or or if salad, you're having salad, more salad. You know, uh, items that don't have, that were lower in carbohydrates. It worked really well. They take more oral medications type 2 do, such as uh, metformin. They're also giving metformin to type 1s now. So phonyureas are old drugs gl- like glucotol, glucotrol or di- diabinase, I think is another one. This um, drug helps squeeze out as much as it can from your pancreas. <laughs> and it, it's famous for causing a low blood sugar um, two to five hours after you take it. So you definitely have to do some patient patient teaching. Some of the rest of these, uh, I don't hear too much of Prandian and Starlix uh, or Precos. Actos, they used to have Actos and Avandia. They got rid of Avandia because it was directly causing cardiovascular problems. Actos, they just kind of monitor that. It works really effectively on after-meal glucose, and that's why it's such a favorite thing, but it causes weight gain. That stinks because you're telling type 2s to lose weight. The DPP-4 inhibitors... um, are in cretins, and that'd be like Victoza. SGLT2 inhibitors, Jardians, Invocana, they work on the kidneys, and then I've got insulin on here. And like I said, there's even more, even more. Um, just remember, we have to always teach people that when they take these drugs, especially insulin, there's always a potential for... for uh, hypoglycemia and that that can be very dangerous and we have to teach them what to do when they have hypoglycemia so this next slide shows you where different drugs how they act on different parts of the body and so you may have more than just one medication you know you could have a combination for example sometimes they give metformin and a a sulfonylurea so do you get low blood sugar from metformin no you get your low blood sugar from your sulfonylurea so um, Biguanides or metformin does not cause low blood sugar. Um, I've got all these drugs written out. I think you guys probably know them all. If if you don't, there was, I think I told you your book had has a list of them with their explanations of the drugs. Uh, yeah, that's that. 1292, 1295, so that you can look those up. But I think you probably know more, well, quite a few of them. 
This was just to show you the normal pancreatic insulin release in the body. And you can see they eat breakfast. Well, it's low. They first got up. They eat breakfast. It shoots up. Take care of that. Goes back down. Eat lunch. Shoots up. Take care of that. Goes back down. Dinner goes way up. So what do you think happened? They probably had a few more carbohydrates. Maybe spaghetti dinner. And then it goes back down. They might have a snack for bed. Little bitty. Goes up. And then that's it. It stays stable the rest of the night. So when we use insulin therapy, here are the areas for an insulin injection. Remember, you stay away two inches away from the belly button, no scars, no bruises. Why would that be? Well, it doesn't metabolize properly in a scar or a bruise and, and in the belly button area. And besides, it would hurt. Upper arms, buttocks, thighs, belly, front thighs, anywhere where there's fat, you can inject insulin. This also shows you how a short-acting insulin works with a long-acting insulin. So they're doing Aspart or Lispro. So that could be um, Novolog or Humalog and Glargine, which is um, Lantus. But see how that Glargine tries to keep a steady, a steady uh, burst of insulin? And then you take the short-acting, bam, it takes care of breakfast. Bam, it takes care of lunch. Bam, it takes care of supper. It works as close to regular insulin as possible. Then I've got an example on there of, an, of a sliding scale. There's different insulin formulas that you can teach someone. You, they can learn how much insulin it takes to bring their glucose down 50 points. How much insulin do they need for 15 grams of carbohydrates? For my mom, one unit of insulin took care of 15 grams of carbohydrates. So... If she was supposed to have six units at every meal, <clears throat> then she would look, they would check her blood sugar before lunch. And if it was, say, like that 160 to 220, then they knew she'd have to have two extra units because it would take that much to bring her back down to baseline. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything here. Um, if you're going to give more than one injection at a time because remember you can never mix anything with glargine never 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 or detamir never mix anything with the long acting if you're giving more than one injection at the same time keep the injections at least an inch apart from each other the abdomen is the quickest to absorb and metabolize insulin insulin arms are second best and thighs are last Also, when you give rapid-acting insulin, you want to treat before you eat. The point to that is don't give somebody rapid-acting insulin and then come back 45 minutes later with their breakfast or lunch or dinner. You'll cause them to have a low. That's quick-acting, rapid-acting insulin. It's supposed to act within 5 to 15 minutes after you give it to them. So make sure they got a meal coming. This is showing you what it looks like with one injection per day. So they're having rapid acting insulin at breakfast, and then they're using MPH for the rest of the day. You can see how this MPH is. It peaks, and then it comes down, and then there's no coverage, it looks like, for quite some time before breakfast. And any place that rapid acting and MPH cross can be a low. Here's two injections per day. Mixed. This is MPH and rapid acting. This is not regular, but it's rapid acting. So you can see here again, you've got a, between dinner and the snack is a quite a big chance for a low blood sugar. Or sorry, between dinner and a snack. Three or four injections per day. This is more like what a person who has, who was not affected. Now, what am I trying to say? If you didn't have diabetes, it's more like what your your uh, pancreas would do with the exception of that MPH. But it looks like they're taking their MPH at dinner for coverage overnight. They'll have a peak, which could give them a low. So we got to make sure they have a snack on board. And then here's the, to me, the optimal way of doing it. You have um, long acting, then you have rapid, 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 and snack. You should be perfect all night long. The snack needs to be a carbohydrate and a protein, though. 
And, you know, you can take one 15 grams of carbohydrates and you could have a, a cup of yogurt. You could have peanut butter and one slice of bread. You could have a piece of lunch meat and one slice of bread or cheese and an apple, stuff like that. Here it is with an insulin pump where you manage that much more precisely. And we just got through telling you all these. Um, just some good facts here. Longer duration of action, the less predictable the absorption. Larger dose of, in, of insulin have prolonged absorption. That's when they came up with that, remember, that U500 uh, and I think a U300 where it was five times more concentrate and three times more concentrate. I don't hear a lot about that anymore, but that was developed for people who are taking large amounts of insulin. It is very dangerous. Um, factors that increase absorption, which I want you, don't want you to take this that we should do this. We don't want to increase absorption. We want the insulin to be absorbed as it's naturally as possible so if there was if you put heat or you massage the area or you ex ex exercise the area that you inject it it's going to make it absorb faster we don't want that we want it to absorb at a normal rate injection site scars we talked about that and give sub q not im if you give it im it increases your risk for hypoglycemia because it doesn't metabolize properly in a muscle like it does in adipose tissue so what type of insulin is never mixed with any other insulin? Is it Lispro, Regular, Gargene, or MPH? Why? You knew it all along, didn't you? Gargene, never mix that with anything else. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, we want to always make sure we teach our patients to rotate sites because if they don't, they'll have skin that looks like an orange peel. I saw that one time. A person who just kept didn't know any better and just kept in uh, injecting the same exact place. All right. Nursing management, diabetes education, worth it, worth it, worth it. <clears throat> we talked about making sure that we're proactive and helping that person get with, you know what, even if they've had diabetes for 100 years, they may have never had any diabetes education. It's always good to refer somebody to that. So it's compliance-based. Healthcare professionals are experts, and the uh, clients then comply. So we like the doctors to tell the patients to come to, to diabetes education because they usually do what the doctor says. It does empower the, the client or the patient. It makes them able to... They know what diabetes is. They know how to treat it. They know it's not the end of the world. Because I had one, one guy say to me, I'll never be able to have my favorite pie again. That's not true. You can have it. You just got to budget those carbohydrates. And it's very, very, uh, what's the word? Freedom, very uplifting for people to know that it's, no, it doesn't mean you can never have a beer. No, it doesn't mean you can't have wine or a mixed drink or you can. You just have to be careful. Uh, this also says survival education. If you've only got a few minutes or some short time with a patient, you've got to teach them survival education. That is how do you inject that insulin if that's what they've got to give themselves or how do you take your pills, what are the side effects of that. We, we have to teach them how to treat hypoglycemia, what to do on a sick day, and that's probably the big things right there. They got to know how to take their medicine and they got to know how to manage a low blood sugar and a sick day. Speaking of that, on a sick day, it's people don't people think they shouldn't take their insulin cuz they're not eating. What they don't realize is the stress of illness increases blood sugar. It does on anyone. And then you have an impaired pancreas trying to take care of that. So you still take your medication even when you're sick. Now, if it was something where somebody was vomiting and they vomited up their medicine, I would call my doctor back before I took any more. You want to let somebody know when you're sick like that so they can check on you. <clears throat> um, okay. Oh, yeah. I've got one. Teaching a person how to inject insulin, direct observation of self-care is the best tool to determine readiness for discharge. If they can repeat that back to you, then you can feel pretty confident that they're okay. 
This is just a tool that Merck, Merck made. It's a game. It's a game to learn about diabetes management. It's pretty fun. Meal planning. I think we sort of talked about this. Uh, you can't, they can't have a dietitian come, but a diabetes educator knows how to help you plan for your meals. They do usually a diabetes education services has a dietary person, a dietitian, and also a nurse. And it should have a physician and a pharmacist. That should be your team. <clears throat> so we need to find out what do they eat, what's their budget like, and we need to help them plan meals within their means and what they eat. And you know, this can be done. Uh, this says carbohydrates, 40 to 60 grams. That's in your uh, book. You know that men can have more carbohydrates than women, generally speaking, because they have more muscle mass. So women tend to, especially if they're overweight, need to stay about 30 grams of carbohydrates per meal. Protein, 15 to 20%. This is all from your book. Uh, exchange lists are not used anymore. People used to starve on the diabetic diet. Now when they go by carbohydrates and choices, like I said, you can eat anything. If you find out that, that an eighth of a piece of pie, which may not sound like much, but it's your favorite pie, if that's 15 grams of carbohydrates or 30 grams of carbohydrates, then you just take off that much from the meal you had planned and you eat more greens and you eat more meats so that you can have that. You No food should be prohibited when you're on a diabetes diet, none. They can all be, it can all be um, worked out. Uh, alcohol can be included in your meals, but what you have to watch for is hypoglycemia, and that can happen hours after you drink. That is also true for anyone who does not have diabetes. Alcohol can lower your blood sugar hours after you eat. What happens is <clears throat> alcohol is toxic. It is a poison, and when you're, when you're drinking, your liver is trying to rid the body of that poison. So if you're drinking and you're also having a little blood sugar, your liver is going to concentrate on the toxins before it's going to make glucose to take care of your low blood sugar. Do you see what I mean? So it's going to let you fall really, really low before it does any good. So you should always have a meal when you drink. Always have a meal. And then men are only supposed to have, I think, two drinks and ladies just one. You just need to be careful. Sweet drinks quickly increase your blood glucose. And, of course, then they do, alcohol decreases your inhibitions and then you overeat. I'll tell you a funny story. I always have a story, don't I? I was wearing a continuous glucose monitor to see how it feels to wear it, and it fit in the fat of my belly. It was a little, th it was a little needle that was injected in the fat of my belly, and then it recorded information on my blood sugars continuously. And then I was to take them four times a day, and then um, record that. And so while I was wearing it over the weekend, because we were going to put them on people, we ended up not doing it. But I was in training then. And while I wore it over the weekend, I had wine. I had wine on Friday night. And I had wine on Saturday night because I love wine. And anyway, what I did not realize is during the during my sleep, my blood sugar had dropped. When I'd come in, I didn't know it. When I came in to work on Monday and they took that off of me and the lady ran it through the software, she said, what'd you do on Friday and Saturday night? I said, well, nothing. What'd you have to eat? This, this, this. What'd you have to drink? Wine and diet pop and coffee and cream. And she said, it's that wine. My blood sugar had dropped 42 on one of those nights and 47 on the other. And I was sleeping right through it. Of course, you know, I probably had the sweats and everything else from the low blood sugar. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, that was pretty, it opened my eyes. I guess I'm trying to tell you, it opened my eyes. Healthy eating, look at this. Now, if a person, some people get overwhelmed by all these carbohydrates here, choices there. Look, you can do this plate method too. I think this is ingenious. And show them, okay, put your meat on this side, put your um, starchy vegetable on that side, and put your non-starchy vegetable on that side. And then poof. They know exactly how to eat right there. This is 45 grams of carbohydrates. You got your milk that takes care of one choice. Your oranges takes care of another. And your sweet potatoes, I'm assuming that's what that is, takes care of the third. And then for especially type 2, we don't count the meat or the, the squash because the carbohydrate level is so low or non-existent. But if it's to exercise, 
exercise is incredible. I just recently went, I took my blood sugar and I walked up and down my street and I walked around my yard, probably about 30 minutes of walking. And that's it. I'm not, I'm not doing a marathon. I'm just walking. I try to walk kind of fast, but I'm walking with my neighbor and we're chatting and my blood sugar dropped 100 points. That's the truth. It went from 241. Oh, actually it was 110 points to 131 in just one hour of that kind of exercise. So it is golden, and exercise works for a long time after you get done exercising too. So there are some precautions, as you can see over here. If somebody's blood sugar is already 250, we probably don't want them to exercise, and that is because initially your blood sugar goes up, which makes sense. Um, Your muscles need that glucose. Your body is trying to put it out there, and at first it goes up. Then uh, if you're taking insulin, you need to have a 15 gram carbohydrate snack before you exercise. And you should never exercise if your blood sugar is less than 100. Never, never, never. You need to get something in your body and then you can go exercise. And always, type 1 or type 2 should always carry a snack with them. Being active, we just talked about that. Simple ways to be more active. These are just little things you can use to teach your, your patient. Show them it's not so hard. Uh, Blood glucose monitoring, this is key. If you know how to monitor and you monitor your blood glucose, you're in control. You're in charge. You can do something about that hyperglycemia. Monitor more frequently when you're you're sick. Monitor at least four times a day when you're taking insulin. Keep your glucometer handy for times when you aren't sure what your glucose is but you feel the symptoms of hypoglycemia. And you're going to ask me what those are. And I think those are coming up. Yes. Take your medicines every day. You can't skip on your medicines. Take them every day. Uh, When you're sick, let your physician know, because they may tell you differently. Some surgeons ask that you take half your insulin prior to to a procedure, maybe none of your oral medication. Surgery is also stress on the body, and stress elevates glucose. Solving problems. Um, it says learn how to be a diabetes detective. And the example I've got in here is a lady that came to the uh, diabetes center and said that for every day, for as long as she could remember at 10 a.m., she had a low blood sugar. And when they did some investigating, they found that she was on a sulfonylurea and not having a snack between breakfast and lunch. And once she remedied that, she didn't have her low blood sugars anymore. So that's solving your problem. Here's hypoglycemia and risk factors. So low blood glucose is called insulin, people call it an insulin reaction. It's seen in type 1 and type 2. Glucose levels at which the patient becomes symptomatic varies with the individual, and that's the truth. If you're somebody that walks around with higher glucoses, then when your blood sugar drops to, to say, I, say my blood sugar was always around 200. Well, then when it drops to 100, I might feel the symptoms. Whereas somebody who keeps their blood sugar around 120s, 150s, they might get to 80 before they feel the symptoms, or 70. So it says um, it usually doesn't occur with blood glucose over 70. Some people get pretty low. And then what can cause it? An overdose of insulin. One time my mom mixed up her bottles. She took 30 units of rapid-acting insulin instead of 30 in, was it 30? instead of 30 units of Lantus. So, of course, I took her to the hospital. That would have been 600 grams of carbohydrates to try to cram in her throat. You know what, though? They didn't do anything. They gave her a sandwich, um, I think an apple, some milk, something like that, and she never did bottom out. She got down to, like, one teens. That made me so scared. Uh, Skipping meals or eating less than usual especially if you take insulin, overexertion without compensation, and then delayed gastric emptying, which can happen to people that have had diabetes for some time. It's called gastroparesis. So a person, we talked about having hypoglycemia unaware, and then uh, other causes of hypoglycemia can be a decreased liver glucose production after alcohol ingestion, as we talked about, decreased insulin clearance due to progressive kidney failure. What does it feel like to have hypoglycemia? Here we go. Also, table 6412 has symptoms of hyperglycemia versus hypoglycemia. 
So shaky, nervous, irritable, tachycardia, tremors. People may have all of these, some of these. They're going to have some of these. Some people feel like they're hungry. For me, I always feel sick to my stomach, and it's hard to eat. They might be pale. They might have tingling, headache, inability to concentrate. That's true. Blurred vision, slurred speech, depending on how bad it is. What do you do? Well, here's what you do. It's called the 1515 rule. And you check your blood sugar. Let me see here. What I got on the next page. I want to make sure I mess up. Yeah. So say I'm feeling those symptoms, shaky, tired, irritable, can't concentrate, whatever my symptoms like that are, I, I know I've got low blood sugar. And so I check it and my blood sugar's less than 70. So what am I going to do? Well, you feel like cramming everything in your throat because your blood sugar is so low. But don't do that because then you'll have a rebound. So one tablespoon of honey or two or three glucose tablets, um, four ounces of orange juice or regular soda, six to ten hard candies if the person is conscious. Now, you don't want to put hard candies in somebody that's not functioning well. They'll choke to death. They've also got gels out there. They've got shots out there that you can use. So my blood sugar is below 70. I take my 15 grams of carbohydrates and I wait 15 minutes. Check my blood sugar again. If it's still 70 or below, then I'm going to treat another time. I'm going to take another half a glass of orange juice or another tablespoon of honey. And I'm going to wait 15 more minutes. If it's going to be... If it's going to be more than an hour before I eat a meal, then I need to have a snack. So in that 15 minutes, I would have that I would have that snack. Now, the other thing to remember is to teach your patients not to count these carbohydrates in their daily consumption. These are treatment carbohydrates, and that's what they are. They still need to go and have a meal that has the 45 grams of carbohydrates or whatever you guys have set up that works for them. These are treatment carbohydrates, and they don't count. <clears throat> they need to learn this. This is a survival treatment here so everybody needs to know how to take care of themselves if they have a low blood sugar i've got in here some hospitals are not teaching the 15 15 rule and they're not giving orange juice instead they're giving iv glucose and that's true they'll just come in and give you a little shot of glucose 50 percent dextrose the text states to give 30 grams of carbohydrates if the blood sugar is 50 or lower this is something that can be kind of uh, customized per person but like I said, in the hospital, they're not going to treat like that anymore. They're going to just put in some glucose. So make sure your patient knows what to do. We want to reduce risks such as don't smoke anymore. Uh, see your doctor regularly. Make sure you vi visit the eye doctor cause, so we can make sure no, nothing's going on with those blood vessels in the eye. Check your feet. Don't People with diabetes should not cut their own toenails. Well, let me take that back. If you're going to cut your toenails... You want to cut them straight across and buff the edges because you don't want a chance. You don't want to make the chance of being a, of getting um, an ingrown toenail. So cut them straight across and buff the sides. You don't want to get into too hot of a bath. Um, <clears throat> oh, it says wear an ID bra bracelet that says you have diabetes. Put it on your phone. I know a couple of students that tattooed it on their wrist. I thought that was cool. Don't walk around without your shoes because if you can't feel your feet very well, you're going to get cuts and they're going to get infected. And then you'll have a risk for infection. Also, 6410 has foot risk categories for you to check out. Then there's healthy coping. I can get there. Healthy coping. You need to learn how to cope with your stress. Ha ha, I don't know how to do that very well either. But stress, stress is definitely causes hyperglycemia so find some activities maybe you like to walk they've got on here journals um, things you're grateful for exercise deep breaths yoga meditation whatever it takes to help you cope with life and then here's a case study and maybe we'll do this case study in person how about that I think that's what we'll do. And then also I have, it says a few words about living with diabetes. These are really good. Um, I, I enjoyed them. So if we've got time, and I think we will, this is usually one of my shorter lectures, then we'll uh, do that case study and we will watch some of these videos. I've